Okay, we have been talking about talking with God, and last week we talked about listening uh, to God. And so Vicki Wangenstein had an experience that she wants to come up and tell about. So Vicki, would you please come up and tell us about listening to God? Yes. Well, I was asleep in the middle of the night, of course, and about 2 o'clock God woke me up. You can't hear me? Use my phone. So God woke me up, and it was to do with my checkbook. And I thought, well, I hope I have enough money to cover these bills that I just paid. So I went, oh, I'll just wait and wait, go back to sleep and get up. Well, no, God said, no, you need to get up now. So I got up, turned on the computer, looked, and went, oh, my gosh, I'm in trouble. And it wasn't that I didn't have the money. Somebody hacked into my account about $200 from, of all places, Arizona. <laughs> Guess where I'm moving to? Arizona. Mesa, Arizona. So I woke Paul up, and he kind of looked. So the next day, we went to the bank. Well, we got our money back. Somebody did hack, and they did take the money. But it was me listening to God. You know, when you know something, when God talks to you, you can't go back to bed. You just can't. So. That's what I wanted to share with everybody, how listening to God is very important. Very important. Thank you, Vicki. You know, as we've been in this series, we talked first of all about knowing God, and uh, we found that that is very important for us because a lot of times we just say things like, oh my God, whenever something happens, and we're not really thinking about who we're talking about. And so we really need to talk about knowing God we need to also talk about listening to God, and we also need to talk about today, the third message in the series is talking with God. Now, sometimes we call it prayer, and so prayer for us preachers is like is like Bible study. So we go, you guys got to pray, and everybody goes, yeah, 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 and we go, you got to read your Bible, and we're going like, oh, yeah, 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 and so we seem to minimize what it actually means for us to either understand God's Word and to live in it or to be able to talk to God Himself. We like hearing from God, like, hey, I'm overdrawn. Oh, I didn't want to hear that. Uh, hey, you're getting a lawsuit. No, I didn't want to hear that. And so a lot of times the, the uh, experiences of life will have us wanting to talk with Him. So I want to talk to you today about talking with God. And it's not because I do it better, it's not because I do it more than some of you, it's because I have been convinced of the preciousness of prayer. And so a gentleman by the name of Octavius Winslow wrote a book called The Precious Things of God. And one of the things that he listed in there was prayer. Do you realize that we have the opportunity because we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the opportunity to talk to Him directly. Yes. The Creator. Yes. Remember what Job said? Job says, oh, I wish I could just die. But then God asks him a series of questions. He says, where were you when I formed the foundations of the earth? Do you know where the deer go to have birth? and a whole bunch of other questions. And you know that Job was able to talk with God? I mean, one of the greatest examples that we have of talking with God was Enoch. And Enoch, not the city, Enoch, the guy in the Bible, Enoch, the guy in the Bible, talked with God, walked with God in such a close thing that one day God said, Enoch, we're having a great time in fellowship here. Your heart is as my heart. Why don't you just come home with me? And Enoch did, because he was no more. And so we can understand that there is a great communication that needs to take place. But we need to check out some foundational stuff first. So let's look at some definitions. And there's a handout available for you in the bulletin. If you did not get a handout, if you would raise your hand, we'll get you one. Does anybody need a handout? Okay. All right. So here we go. So here's the definitions. These are the same as the last two weeks. 
because I want you to understand how vital these things are. The title of the series is Established by Grace, and so I want to talk to you about established. Established means that I am firmly founded upon the unchanging nature of God. God does not change. There are no shifting shadows with God, Scripture says. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You don't need to worry about the future because God's already got that taken care of. Not your worrying, but God's got the future taken care of. You can read about it in the book. It's called, the end is called the book of Revelation. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so you can find out everything. Yes, you can scare yourself reading it, but if you know God and trust Him, it's a great comfort to you. The next word that we need to get down is grace. We need to understand grace. By faith in Jesus Christ, I am no longer subject to God's wrath. Why would I be subject to God's wrath? Because the sin of my original human parents, Adam and Eve, they rebelled in the garden, and therefore there's a penalty that has to be paid for that sin. Always, because God is a holy God, there is none like Him, and He cannot abide any sin. He could not just say, oh, you sinful creature, come and have fellowship with me. That's impossible. Okay, so He made a way through Jesus Christ. You can read the very beginnings of it in Genesis chapter 3. When He says, He says, the snake's going to bite you on the heel, but one of your descendants is going to stop his head. And that happened to Calvary. Okay, so we we are totally forgiven, past, present, and future. Hopefully you begin to sin less as you get older in Christ, not sin more to see if God's forgiveness really works. That's called testing God. And so you don't want to do that because you're going to fail the test. And so we need to know that totally forgiven, and there's an acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. Jesus paid it all for us so that we might be able to we might be able to have the fullest life possible. Okay, what is mercy? Mercy is relief from the misery of a life separated from God. Grace and mercy are not the same thing. Grace and mercy are not the same thing. They both come from God's love for us, but mercy removes us from the misery of of a life separated from Him. Whenever I think about how miserable I would have been had I not known Christ and not walked with Him, I just, I go, it would have been tough. It would have been tough to know what life is like and then to not have the experience. So God gives us grace to be able to know Him. He gives us mercy to live life in this culture. Okay? And so we need to understand that the foundational thought for everything for us is that everything starts with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. We operate, mankind, womankind, whatever pronoun you assign to yourself, we operate in God's sphere of creation, not the other way around. God, I really need you. If he was not our God, he could say, well, I'm not sure I really need you. But he doesn't. He says, well, he says, the Son came for you. If you believe in the Son by a transformed heart, he says, I will be with you. Jesus even said, I am with you always to the end of the age. Has anybody here ever found that God was not on their side? No hands. Okay? You guys are good. Okay, the first words that it says in God's Word, right here in the 39 books of the Old Testament, right here, the first words, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, he's not talking about the big ending of a baseball game, he's talking about the beginning of everything, God created the heavens and the earth. That ought to give you an idea of how great our God is. And can you imagine the God that created the Grand Canyon 
the God that created the Grand Canyon, we are able to talk to him. And we can hear from him. Vicki heard from him. That was not some lesser imp that came and talked to her in the middle of the night. It was the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said that the Holy Spirit is going to teach you everything and remind you of everything because I'm going back to the Father. God has a plan and a progression. So we need to understand that we have the opportunity to communicate with God. So communication with God is very important. So whenever we look at communication with God, there's a statement I want us to, I want us to get a hold of. Next slide, there we go. Okay, and it's like this. I came up with this yesterday because I think this is vitally important. And we need to say that communication with God happens because of my faith in Jesus Christ. I am established in God's grace and can listen for his voice and talk with him. I enjoy talking. Big surprise, huh? I enjoy talking. We were out at uh, the Annex Ranch yesterday. We had a barbecue, and I met somebody that I had never known or met before, and we just sat and talked. What did we talk about? Nothing. We just talked and told stories. And I mean, it was great. And I noticed Steve was out there doing the same thing. He was talking and telling stories. And so that's what communication is. Whenever you communicate ideas, philosophies, ideals, and goals, and experiences without an agenda of changing somebody else. That's what we call fellowship. You see, Christianity, following Christ, is not something where you can just kick back in your lazy boy and expect it to happen. It's, it's not passive. It's active. So then we see here in the Lord's Prayer, the first few verses, it says, this then is how you should pray. So this then is how you should talk to God. We're going to look at this in depth in a moment. And it says, Jesus said this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, Father in heaven, your name is the holiest name above all. There are no other names that are not associated with sin as great as yours is, completely free from sin. So we need to understand that there is somebody that we can talk to, and we need to understand that because we're establishing God's grace that we can do that. So why do we have problems with prayer? Well, here are some of our problems with prayer. Number one, I am personally busy. I am busy. Do you have time? No, I'm busy. How about if God was so busy he couldn't give you your next heartbeat? How'd you like that? I am so busy, I am distracted by life events and responsibilities. What will we do when they take away Google Calendar? Celebrate. <laughs> Okay, here's the second one that is a bad way to think. God knows everything. That's true. So I don't need to tell him about my issues. Oh, really? God knows what's going on in my life. Yes, as a matter of fact, he does, and he's not really too happy about it. I mean, is that not pride? What, what is sin? Sin is thinking that God can't keep his promises, he's not powerful enough to do it, and his word is never sure. That's sin. So I better step in and do it myself. That's pride. Okay, number three. I prayed, but I didn't get an answer. So why is this time going to be any different? Why? What did the Apostle Paul say? He said, I know a man that was taken up to the third heaven, and when he prayed to have the thorn in the flesh removed, God said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's not what I wanted! But it was good enough for Paul. We want to understand what our life is like from the past to the future. We want to know everything about the details. We want to know what's going to happen when this, this, and this. 
Why do we want to know that? We want to know that God's got it completely so we can go ahead and do what we want to know that he's going to catch us. It's like some people, they come to church on Sunday so that they can live like hell the rest of the week. How about this one? These are not things that you should do. These are things that sometimes people say. I did read this in a book. I mostly wrote down stuff that I thought in my own life. I'm doing okay right now. I'll call upon God when I need him. Is it easier to trust God in adversity or in times of prosperity? Let me tell you the answer. It's tougher to trust him in times of prosperity. Why? Because the stress is gone. One time when I was in construction and had my own company, it was 1980, big financial downturn. I had some spec houses. I thought that we were going to live in three houses with permanent financing at the same time. They were not cheap houses. Construction loan money started out at 8.5%, and by the end of that year, or during that year, it went to 22.5% interest. doing okay. Somebody even asked me then, it must be nice to be a big contractor and write all those checks. I said, no. I said, writing the checks is not the joy. Making the deposits is the joy. <laughs> so see, we're so dependent upon circumstances that we don't understand that being with God and praying to God and communicating with Him is based on a relationship. So the last one, here you go. Because God the Father is unseen, I can't read his facial expressions. I don't know his body language. I don't know his emotional intelligence quotient. Well, I want to suggest that you can discover it here in his word. Everything. Okay. Those are the problems that we have with prayer. You may be able to write some additional ones. Don't write them to live them out, okay? These are just ways of highlighting what the issue is so that we can deal with the solution to the problem. Okay, so now here's a prayer that I'm going to have them put up, and I want us to pray it together. And yes, I have added a little addendum at the end for thine is the kingdom, the power, etc., which was not in the original text. So here we go. Why don't you read it along with me? This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What are some of the things that we just prayed? Well, first of all, we address God's rightful place as the Father. When we're talking to the Father, we're also talking to the Son and the Spirit because He's a triune God. But God is the preeminent one in the hierarchy that we have there in heaven of co-equal, co-eternal, and co-essential. So we need to understand that it's His rightful place as the ruler. And so we need to also understand that we worship and praise God for everything that he's done and who he is. We also need to acknowledge that God's wills and plans are in control and not our own. We used to sing a little song, I'm not my own, I belong to Jesus. I went, I used to go, wow, it's a good thing because I ain't doing too good right now. <laughs> Okay, we also ask for God for the things that we need. Whenever it's talking about bread, it's not talking about, it's not talking about uh, uh, wholesome bread or any of those other kinds of things. What it's talking for is everything that we need to survive. Do you remember all of the years that God provided the Israelites in the wilderness with manna? And it didn't stop until they came into the land, then it stopped? I mean, that was 40 years. Manna and quails on a regular basis. Okay, we also said that we need to confess our sins. Oh, to who? How about to God himself because he knows, but you need to get real. Okay? 
So this is a typical prayer of Jesus' day. Jews prayed this. It's got praise, petition, and a, and a yearning for God's promised kingdom. But let's look at some principles of prayer. I'm not going to dissect this prayer. You can do that. But let's look at some principles of prayer. And I want to tell you there's five of them. So the first one is I'm going to focus on being with the Father. Being, not doing. Being. That means that as I walk along and as I, and as I turn my thoughts towards him, that I begin to engage in the relationship. And the more that I do that, the more I will do that. Even whenever Emma and I are together, we are communicating with God the Father because we're thinking our own thoughts while we're being with each other. We are being with him. And then sometimes one of us will say something to the other that has a profound impact, or not, on, uh, on the other one and their walk with God. But you see, that's the way it's always supposed to be. We need to focus on being with him. It's a relationship built on love, not on performance. Amen. Our relationship, our relationship is secure because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are secure. Well, what, do you believe in eternal security? Well, you're eternally secure as long as you're secure in Jesus Christ. If you're eternally secure because of your membership in an organization, it ain't going to happen. That's right. Okay? The next thing is, I sometimes hear people say, well, my, my father beat me, molested me, and was just mean to my mama, so I don't know if I can trust God the Father. Well, God the Father is not your earthly father. God your father abhors all of that sin and would never do that to you. Your earthly father, however, needs a dose of repentance. He needs to understand God. So whenever we say our father, we're talking about a being that is totally other than we are, totally magnificent, gains all the glory, operates on our behalf, loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. John 3.16. Okay? Number two. Don't try to, number two, there we go. Don't try to fake it until you make it with God. That's right. You can't. God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners and hostile to God, we did not like him because he was pointing out how puny we are. But yet Christ still died for us. Is that not unreal? So what are you going to be faking to be able to do it? Nothing. You can't fake it anyway because people know who you are. You need to operate in reality. Reality, not fantasy. How do I operate in the reality of God? What I do is I carry myself as a temple of the Holy Spirit dispensing God's love to all of those that I come in contact with. You can't fake it until you make it. I was doing a wedding out on, uh, in San Diego for a cousin's son and his uh, intended. And um, the unity candle that we were lighting because we were right there on the coast and in the court courtyard of a big hotel in La Jolla, because of the wind coming in, the unity candle wouldn't, wouldn't get lit. And so they couldn't do the lighting of the two candles. And so I, knowing my cousin very well, and knowing his son very well, and so without, re and I forgot that my microphone was on, and I said, just fake it. And of course it goes out, just fake it. Yeah. And so it's not a good sign for the start of the marriage. Okay. Number three, you need to invite God into every part of your life. There is no part of your life that is hidden from Him. That's right. And so you need to understand that He does. He sees all, knows all, has all the power, has all the presence, has everything. So you need to understand that you need to be joyful always. You need to give thanks 
But oh, here's a key one. Pray continually. Some of my prayers in the past have gone, Father, I really thank you for what you are, what you're doing, and everything else. I don't know why I'm here. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm really trying to trust you. So I don't really need deliverance from the circumstances. I just need to know you're here. What does he say back? Get in the Word. If I go in the Word and I find things like Jeremiah 29 11, I know the plans that I have for you, it's for a future and a hope. Whoa, really? Out of all of this mess? Yes. So I'm going to have to invite God into every part of my life. Did you know that sometimes failure? is a better indicator of success and influence in life than total success? Yeah. I mean, it really is. How many of you in here have failed? <laughs> okay, those of you that did not, Pastor Allen, have you ever failed in life? Sure. Okay. You didn't have your hand up. I just <laughs> I, he failed to have his hand up. So, failure brings us closer to God yes. because His restorative power is always there. So we got to invite God into every part of our life, not just church. Church is supposed to be the gathering of the called out ones that come to know God and to know Him better and to love on each other and tell each other that we approve. We know what you're going through and we're praying for you. And we're watching as Mike Horse always says, prayer works. Okay. Number four, how or where you pray is not the issue. You don't need to have a Tibetan prayer wheel that keeps going with the wind. Wow, we could even be a positive prayer community here if Tibetan prayer wheels actually work. You know where you hung the prayers on them and then they rotate them in the wind? Whoa, just think about all the prayers we could be sending up or litter we could be putting on the ground. And it says go into your closet and close the door, go to your room, but you don't have to have a special room. I mean, we're not, War Room was a movie, okay? And the point of War Room was that intense prayer and focus on God brings about change in people's lives. It was just not about the exaltation of an architectural portion of a dwelling for prayer because could you pray out in the yard yes would God be able to hear you yes can you pray in your car yes can you pray while you're on your motorcycle yes can you pray while you're sitting there yes or standing or kneeling or laying just don't fall asleep but you see, your father who sees what's done in secret, in other words, don't go stand on the corner of Main and Center Street and start praying to make a show. Who tried that last week? Nobody. Okay, good. Look at Daniel. In Daniel 6, it tells him he heard that a decree had been published and this is after the handwriting on the wall took place. Tell me God doesn't talk to pagans, huh? Handwriting on the wall. You have been found weighed in the balance and found wanting. Therefore, the Persians are getting it all. So much for that Babylonian victory, fe victory fest. So what did Daniel do whenever he heard that? Daniel went into his room and he prayed with the windows open towards Jerusalem. What is the key here? Jerusalem? No. The windows? No. The key is Daniel pray. That's the key. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then some guys went and snuck around, and they found him praying. And they joined right in, and they had a big Persian prayer meeting. No. The next thing is, Daniel's going to the lion's den.
What happened there? God delivered him, didn't he? What happened to the guys who caused the ruckus? They got eaten the next day. Kitty cats like to eat. <laughs> does God's eternal wrath come in strange forms? Oh, yes it does. So where or how you pray is not the issue. Prayer is the issue. It's the communication with God. And these principles will help you find your pattern of prayer with Him. I found, a, I found a source of, I like to have music on while I pray. I don't like to have words because I listen to the words. I actually woke up this morning and I sang a song to Emma. Isn't that romantic? <laughs> I sang a song to Emma. <laughs> yeah, what a romantic song. I got up this morning and as I woke up, the words of the song, Blessed Assurance, came to my mind. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. I mean, and all the rest. And it just, I just kept flowing through me. And I went, oh, Father, thank you. I love it. Okay, number five. Here is probably the most important thing in addition to being in a relationship with God. Trusting prayer when we pray in faith. Faith means I have eradicated my mistrust of God and I am now forsaking everything else and I am operating in the surety of Jesus' love and forgiveness. Okay, trusting prayer enables God to use us in matters of eternal significance. Eternal. Eternal is different than temporal. Temporal means right now. God is able to use you just like he used Daniel for eternal significance. God is able to use you in the lives of others. If you are communicating with God, if you are communicating with God and you are hearing from God, then you will be an influencer in the lives of others. It operates automatically. As soon as you turn to God, He gives you, Jesus said it this way, He's going to, the Holy Spirit's going to come and He's going to instruct you in everything and He's going to remind you of everything that's been said. That's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And you're going to be there in the midst of other people and God's going to change their lives because you have allowed Him to change yours and you are trusting Him for everything. We have no choice. We have no choice that makes any sense. Trusting Him is what we need to do. And here's the famous verse that we use. If my people who are called by my name, who's that? That's us. If you'll humble yourself and quit thinking that you got it all together, and if you pray and you seek His face, and if you turn from your wicked ways, don't be, don't be donating to Planned Parenthood. And then God will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. I want this land healed. Amen. I am praying for things. I am watching as evil in the halls of government is being exposed. Yeah, right. If you're a fan of Donald Trump, how many of you thought that Mueller was going to get him? And what happened? We prayed we are not political prayers. Oh, God bless the Republicans. They're the only godly party. Oh, God bless the Democrats because they're the only ones that care about us. Oh, God bless the Libertarians because they don't care about anything. That's not us. God, I want your righteousness to reign in our government. You set it up. You set up civil authorities for the furtherance of the gospel. And I don't care who's there. I want them operating by your commands or I want them out. R, D, I, whatever. doesn't matter. I don't care. What I care is that God's will be done. How can we do it? It says here, therefore, since we have a great high priest, 
What is a priest? It's somebody who represents us before God. We are a kingdom of priests. So now, because of Jesus, the Son of God, we can approach and firmly to the great God and His throne of grace. Okay, so how do I get started? Here's the next one. Almost done. You're going to have to, to have your prayer be effective. God hears all the prayers, but God really only acts on the prayers of His children. Now maybe sometimes God will act on a prayer of an unbeliever to be able to move them to a place of belief. It happens. We hear about it all the time. So we need to always pray because our Father wants to hear from us. Earthly fathers say things to their children like, go to your room. God says, I hear that. I'll answer it. And you know, dear child, that the answer is yes, no, or wait. I'm working some things out here. So you're going to have to do it. Okay, so you're going to have to become a member of God's family through trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is very important. The next thing is, you're going to have to start allowing the Holy Spirit to guide your thoughts. Yeah. A lot of a, a lot of people like to use GPS on their phone, and they trust GPS to give them the right directions to go someplace. I don't. I like maps. Who says GPS is right? I remember one of the first inertial navigation systems that they started up on the submarine I was on. This would be 1967. They started it up, and all of a sudden it starts whirring away. There we were sitting tied up to the dock in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and it had us somewhere up by Altoona, Illinois. <laughs> can't trust those things. You can trust the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You can even ask God, God, I, I, I tried to find my own way. I thought I got it by memory. We had a funny thing yesterday. We were laughing about it. Uh, we went out to Yannick's for the uh, barbecue, and uh, I was musing. Uh, Pastor Allen had called and asked for the address. I didn't have it. And uh, so I got him in touch with Pam, and he could get it. But I thought, you know, the old way in Cedar City and Iron County of giving directions was, Go out to the west until you get to the sign that says where the wind blows through. Turn to the left, go down to the corner, don't turn into Matheson's yard, but make the round, go keep going, and go across from where Jimmy Butler started building his house before he moved out of the area. And then whenever you look over there, that's the place. That's the way we used to do directions. Or go down to where the Johnson place used to be, make a left, go down. You know where those trees were that all burned? Yeah, that's that's where you need to go. Then turn to the right and go down go down a little ways. You'll go through a dip, and there it is over there on the left. That's Cedar City direction. Okay. So what we need to do is start allowing the Holy Spirit to guide our thoughts. What He will do is He will show you. Which thoughts are God, God thoughts and which are not? That's what you need. You need a guide. Should I have that last piece of peach cobbler? Todd says yes. Todd is not the Holy Spirit. But I gave in anyway. Okay. You've got to allow the Holy Spirit to guide your thoughts. I think I'm supposed to be as popular as Billy Graham. God says, Billy Graham's up here in heaven with me. Ooh, change that. Okay, the next thing that you're going to have to do to start in prayer is you're going to have to embrace God's love for you through his abiding presence. His abiding presence. He is always with us. The Holy Spirit is always here. next one is this. You're going to have to read the story intensely and frequently. I've been pounding the Bible today, haven't I? 
reading the story intensely and frequently. How are you going to know by demonstrated examples that are objectively verifiable if you don't read about them? Don't just look on your smartphone. Read the Bible. Amen. Read the Bible. You've got to read the story. And then after you read the story and you get used to the story, then you're going to have to do the final thing, which is you need to share your story with others. Because others need to know that you were able to trust God and that you are still breathing and that you, they can now continue to trust the God that you trust. And then gradually they'll begin to build the relationships themselves. It's very important. One of the great joys for me is hearing my course get up and say, prayer works! <laughs> Mike was not always saying that. So. I love it. Okay, why don't you stand with me so now you know all about beginning in prayer. You now know all about talking with God. This is an important thing, folks.